God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning. So glad that you came to worship with us today. If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And we're going to talk about counting the cost of countercultural Christianity. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. While you find your way there, uh, just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your prayers. Thank you for all of your gifts towards phase two. Uh, this last week, we poured the final section of the basement walls. The basement, uh, the walls are now 100% complete. And uh, we were planning on pouring the first about half of the basement slab, uh, but the weather was a little iffy on Friday. Uh, we didn't know whether the rain would hold off and we didn't want pock marks. We didn't want rain marks uh, in our beautiful new basement floor. So we held off, but we do expect that this week we'll pour the entire basement floor. Uh, and we're hurrying now because the steel for the first floor of the building is all fabricated and ready to come to us. And uh, we need to finish the basement floor so we can put that in. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your gifts. We have about $1.4 million dollars that has yet to come in for our jump in capital campaign over the coming year. And we do need all of those funds to come in so that we can finish the building. If you're able to make a gift right now, uh, it would be a tremendous help to us as the money's really starting to fly out the window. Uh, but you know, we haven't borrowed any money yet towards phase two, so <laughs> praise the Lord. I would love to just be able to keep saying that every month. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? How many of you know that nothing is impossible? Nothing's too hard for the Lord. So uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, going to start reading in verse 18. This is what is called Paul's fool speech. And uh, as you listen to the words, maybe you'll understand why it's called that. 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 18, counting the cost of countercultural Christianity. Look with me there, verse 18. Since so many others are boasting in the way the world does, I too will boast. You gladly put up with fools since you are so brilliant. In fact, you even put up with anyone who enslaves you or exploits you or takes advantage of you or puts on airs or slaps you in the face. To my shame, I admit that I was too weak for that. Can you hear a little sarcasm in Paul's voice there? Whatever anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's seed? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled. I have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. And besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not burn with anger? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who is to be praised forever, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor under King Aretas had the city of the Damascenes guarded in order to arrest me, but I was lowered in a basket from a window in the wall, and I slipped through his hands." Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us out of these scriptures today. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. We feel you here with us. And we thank you for your powerful word. Your word is truth. Father, I pray that we would encounter you this morning through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen, amen. and amen with me. One of the foremost experts in leading men and women to freedom from sexual addiction is Dr. Doug Weiss. 
Doug has been a guest speaker here at Harvest Time. We use his materials in some of our discipleship ministries. At Doug's clinic in Colorado Springs, they have an exercise that helps addicts come to grips with the high cost of their addiction. They put the clients in a room with a pad of paper and a calculator, and they ask them to begin to tabulate the financial impact of their addiction. It turns out that sin is devastatingly expensive. My father-in-law says sin will lead you further than you ever wanted to go. It will make you stay longer than you ever wanted to stay, and it will make you pay more than you ever wanted to pay. Doug asked the clients to calculate how many hours of work they missed due to their addiction, how much productivity and potential profit was lost, what opportunities for promotion were lost, did the addiction lead to disciplinary action or even termination. He asked the clients to calculate the amount of money they've spent feeding the addiction directly. Did the addiction lead to a marital separation or a divorce? And what was the financial impact of that? Did it lead to legal troubles? And what was the cost of that? He asked them to calculate the amount of money that they're spending now to get help. And when the exercise is done, the clients usually weep when they realize the cost of their sin. We've given you a little gift today. Did you take a peek at what's inside? It's a calculator. But listen, we want to invite you to count the cost of something entirely different today. I want to ask you to count the cost of authentically living for Christ and sharing Christ in our rapidly deteriorating culture. What is the high cost of countercultural Christianity? I have to confess to you, as phase two begins to take shape, as it begins to rise out of the ground, I find that I'm thinking less and less about the quality of the building. We have an excellent building committee. We have a great board. We have an excellent construction manager. They have got that all covered. But I find that I'm growing more and more anxious about the quality of the congregation that's going to move into that building about a year from now. And I'm deeply concerned about the quality of the congregation that will grow in that new building in the years to come. See, this is just too much work. It has cost us way too much. Too many prayers, too many labors, too many sacrifices to see this building ever occupied by a congregation that is anything less than passionately in love with Jesus and vigorously alive in the Holy Spirit. Beloved, I want to tell you that a sharp divide is coming to American Christianity. And in fact, it's already begun. As our culture and our society overtly reject Christ, they will increasingly resent authentic Christians and attack us. And so we're facing a sober choice. Will we pay the very high price of faithfully adhering to authentic Christianity that's increasingly countercultural, or will we fall for another gospel, one that's compatible with culture and therefore draws no criticisms nor reprisals? This is precisely the issue that Paul is wrestling with in the book of 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 10, we learned that Christ has given us the authority to pull down spiritual strongholds, ideas, philosophies, doctrines, teachings that prevent people from truly knowing and experiencing Jesus. Today, I want to pull down a stronghold in our thinking that has plagued evangelical Christianity in America for about two decades now. American evangelicals have come to believe the false idea that for years now we haven't been sharing the message of the gospel in the right way. We haven't been saying it with the right tone. We haven't been emphasizing the right things and we've been doing church all wrong. And if we would only but tweak the way that we present the gospel society's attitude would change toward us and they would embrace the gospel and embrace us with wide open arms. 
Beloved, can I tell you that as much as we might wish it were true, that is just a false notion. And it stands in direct contradiction to what Jesus himself told us, as well as the New Testament apostles. Modern evangelicals have come to believe that we, if we only do Christianity right, the world will love us and flock to us. But Jesus himself clearly told us that if we really do Christianity right, the world will fiercely hate us and ferociously persecute us. Listen to the words of Jesus. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Therefore be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings. They will arrest you. Brother will betray brother unto death. All men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. You'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. You'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. But as it is, you don't belong to the world because I've chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. Remember, I told you, no servant is greater than his master. Since they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they don't know the one who sent me. Listen to the words of the apostles. Paul said, you know about all my persecutions and sufferings, the things that happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil men and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Peter wrote, the pagans think it's strange that you don't plunge with them into the same flood of sinful indulgence and they heap abuse on you for it. But don't be surprised by this fiery trial as if something strange were happening to you, but rejoice that you're participating in the sufferings of Christ. Beloved, listen to me. This notion that if we do Christianity right, the world will be attracted to us and love us. It's completely opposite of what Jesus said. It's a deceptive stronghold that has distracted our focus from Jesus and from the gospel and has caused us to fixate on methods instead. As if the work of eternal salvation depended on our human cleverness and creativity. And quite predictably, what started out as a criticism of the tone of our message has progressed to criticism about the content of our message so that the gospel itself is being fundamentally altered. Beloved, as we journey towards the culmination of human history, demonic forces are being released on the earth unlike anything that any generation of believers has ever faced. Authentic Christianity has always been countercultural, but it's about to become countercultural at a level of intensity that has never before been seen. Men have always loved the darkness and hated the light of Christ because their deeds are evil, but in these last days they will oppose us with an unprecedented demonic ferocity. So the decision is ahead of us. Will we count the high cost of countercultural Christianity or will we fall for another gospel that is culturally compatible? Now, you might be wondering, what on earth does this have to do with Paul's list of suffering in the back half of 2 Corinthians 11? The answer is it has everything to do with it. The entire letter of 2 Corinthians is Paul's defense of his apostolic ministry, his defense of his gospel and his whole way of life. Paul brought the message of Jesus to the Greek city of Corinth around 50 AD and he founded the church there. 
After about 18 months of laboring among them, Paul left to go check up on his other churches. And immediately on his heels, some troublemakers showed up. False apostles from Jerusalem whose goal was to usurp Paul's authority, to steal the affections and especially the offerings of the Corinthians. They came empowered by another spirit, teaching another Jesus and another gospel, one that was compatible with culture rather than counter to it. And their message was oddly familiar. Their message was, if you do Christianity right the world will love you and you'll enjoy a stress-free, problem-free, peaceful, prosperous life that no one will take issue with. But if you do Christianity wrong, then you'll end up like Paul. Always in trouble. Always creating controversy. Always offending people. Always taking a beating always on the run, always struggling financially, always struggling physically. Many of the new Christians were sucked in by their message. It was a lot more familiar. It was a lot more appealing. It was a lot more comfortable than the upside down values of Paul. His message, his methods of ministry, his whole way of life were just so countercultural that the Corinthians were struggling to hold on to it, especially when they were offered such an attractive alternative. Paul's catalog of suffering in 2 Corinthians 11 illustrates for us the very high cost of countercultural Christianity. I'm going to look at these words together for a few minutes and I want to consider them in the form of three challenges that I'm issuing to you, Harvest Time Church. Will you pay the very high cost of countercultural Christianity? Counting the cost, three challenges from 2 Corinthians 11. The first challenge is this. Harvest Time Church, will you keep practicing the humility of Christ no matter what the cost? Paul makes three comparisons between himself and the false apostles. The first one is in the area of leadership paradigms. The false apostles practice a model of leadership that was compatible with culture. They were large and in charge. They arrived in the city with a flourish, with letters of reference from Jerusalem and an air of spiritual superiority. They impressed the Corinthians with their witty, winsome speaking talent. They asserted themselves by belittling the Corinthians as spiritual novices. Paul says that they slapped the Corinthians in the face. They claimed to possess secrets that could help take the Corinthians to the next level beyond where Paul had led them. They were manipulative and authoritarian in their leadership style. Paul says they pushed themselves on the Corinthians and dominated them. They readily accepted fine food and drink and luxurious lodging and generous offerings. Paul says that they exploited the Corinthians and took advantage of them. In contrast to the false apostles was Paul, who came in the meekness and in the gentleness of Christ. You see, Paul knew the words of the real Jesus. He remembered what the real Jesus taught. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials dominate them, but not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In the world, it is to be expected that leaders will elevate themselves at the expense of the people, even in a republic like ours. Perhaps one could even argue that it's necessary in the world. But the kingdom of God operates on a completely different paradigm. Authentic Christianity is completely counter-cultural to the world. Paul came with the demeanor of a servant. Rather than trying to impress or entertain, he came with a simple message of forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to God. 
He came with the foolish countercultural message of a suffering Savior who lived as a servant and died an ignominious death on a Roman cross. And in order to illustrate that message, Paul lived as a servant before the Corinthians. He did something uncomfortably countercultural. He supported himself by sewing tents rather than receiving their offerings. You know, that was something that was so hard for the Corinthians to wrap their minds around. We already shared with you that the best speakers charged the highest speaking fees. So someone who taught for free couldn't possibly have anything important to say. And for another thing, to work with one's hands was considered distasteful for educated people in Corinth. Paul's insistence on sowing tents was unsettling to the Corinthians. It was abrasive. It belittled his stature in their eyes. Paul says, I worked double duty. I was sleep deprived because of it. And I often went without enough. Rather than throwing his weight around, Paul appealed to the Corinthians as a loving father. He reasoned with them as mature adults. He addressed them as equals in Christ. With a dash of irony, he writes, we admit to our shame that we were too weak to treat you the way the false apostles did. He arrived in Corinth badly shaken from the traumatic experiences that happened to him in Macedonia and physically weak. Unfortunately, Paul discovered that the world's paradigm of leadership is more attractive, more comfortable, more popular with most people, than being led by the Spirit of God. Isn't it something very curious about the sinful heart of man that he prefers the so-called security of being dominated to freedom in the Spirit? Why is it that people are drawn to leaders who are self-promoting and self-serving and self-indulging rather than to those who walk in the fear and the humility of the Lord? You know, the prophet Samuel felt that same sting. He was a humble leader who heard from God and who lifted the people in prayer before God. But the people didn't want a raggedy old prophet. They wanted a king. Samuel said to them, this is what a king will do. He will draft your sons into his army. He will make them keep his war horses and manufacture his weapons and work in his fields. He'll send your sons to the front lines. He'll press your daughters into service as well. He'll take the best of your land and whatever else he wants. He'll tax everything you own and you will all become his slaves. And the people said, yeah, well, we still want a king. Samuel said, testify against me in the presence of the Lord. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I cheated? Whom have I oppressed? From whose hand have I ever accepted a bribe to make me look the other way? But God comforted Samuel and he said, don't mourn, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. And so it was in Corinth. But beloved, listen to me, grasp this with your spirit. In spite of the false apostles' popularity, Paul said, I am not about to change paradigms. I am not going to stop sewing tents. I am not going to stop modeling the way of Christ, servanthood. And I am not going to stop being countercultural. Earlier he wrote, I refuse to become an entertainer. I fear God way too much for that, so that your faith does not rest on man's wisdom but on God's power. So here's my challenge to you, harvest time. Will you continue to practice Christ-like humility no matter what the cost? I use that word practice purposefully because none of us has got it right yet, but will you continue pursuing the fear and the humility of the Lord? If an entertainer shows up and starts to draw people to himself, Will you remain committed to the way of Christ-like humility? If a super apostle shows up selling spiritual secrets that will get you to the next level, will you remain committed to the way of Christ-like humility? You know how to get up to the next level? The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Will you follow Christ-like humility? Even if the masses follow leaders 
who make a good show of strength? Will you resist the urge to look on the outward as men always do and instead ask God to always give you leaders who are after his own heart? Will you model Christ-like humility even if the masses don't get it? Counting the cost of countercultural Christianity, three challenges from 2 Corinthians 11. The second challenge is this. Harvest Time Church, will you keep on loving like Christ no matter what the cost. The second comparison between Paul and the false apostles is in the area of Jewishness. Paul says with irony, I might have failed at being domineering like the false apostles, but I certainly don't fall short in being Jewish. And Paul didn't fall short in his love for the Jewish people either. Paul begins his litany of suffering with five different occasions on which he was whipped by the Jewish synagogue officials. Under the law of Moses, these whippings were to punish Jews who were guilty of blasphemy against the Jewish faith. You know, it's not really amazing to me that Paul was whipped. But what is amazing to me is that after the first time he was whipped, he went back for four more whippings. Here's the thing you have to know. The whipping was so severe that there was a very real danger that a person could die from it. That's why the whipping was limited to 39 lashes. You see, the maximum under the law of Moses was 40 lashes. But the person administering the whipping might lose count. And should the person being punished die, then the punisher would be guilty of murder. So they stopped at 39 lashes, not to protect the victim, but to protect the guy doing the whipping. The first 39 lashes Paul received is really not a surprise. What is a surprise is that he received 156 more. That's how much Paul loved his Jewish people. Even though they kept whipping him, he kept going back again and again with the gospel. He kept on trying. He just loved them too much to quit. Everywhere he traveled, he searched out the Jewish community first, and he preached to the Jews first. Paul says, I have been in danger from my own countrymen, the Jews. At the very beginning of his ministry in Damascus, the Jews tried to kill him. In Jerusalem, the Jews tried to kill him. On Cyprus, a Jewish sorcerer opposed him. In Pisidian Antioch, the Jews stirred up persecution against him, started a mob, and threw him out of the city. In Iconium, they divided a plot to stone him so he ran. Paul says once I was stoned. Now that's not the title of a Bob Dylan song. He means that actually literally. <laughs> it happened in Lystra at the hands of the Jews who pursued Paul from Antioch and Iconium. They dragged him out of the city. They stoned him with stones and they left him for dead. In fact, many believe that he actually was dead. But the new believers gathered around Paul and laid hands on him. And God miraculously raised him up. And you know what Paul did? He went straight back into the city. And he went back to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch again and again, encouraging the new disciples and telling them, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Paul says, I've been in danger in the city. I've been constantly on the run. In Thessalonica, the Jews stirred up a riot and Paul ran. In Berea, the Jews followed him from Thessalonica and started another riot there and Paul ran again. In Corinth, the Jews dragged Paul to court before the proconsul Gallio. In Ephesus, the Jews refused to believe and slandered the gospel. Here's the point. Paul never stopped loving the Jews and he never stopped trying to reach them them, no matter what the cost. I have to tell you the truth. I'm pretty sure that the first 39 lashes would have been enough to convince me that Jewish evangelism is not my calling. <laughs> it's not my sphere. 78 lashes would have done it for sure. But being dragged outside the city and stoned and left for dead would have convinced me to never, ever set foot in another synagogue again, nor ever speak to another Jewish person about Jesus. But after all Paul suffered, he wrote to the Romans, were it possible, 
I wish that I myself could be cut off for Christ if only Israel could be saved. My heart's desire and prayer is to God for Israel that they would be saved. So here's my challenge to you, harvest time. Will you keep on loving like Christ no matter what the cost? Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If your own countrymen begin to persecute you, will you love them enough to keep trying to reach them anyway? If they accuse you of being un-American because of your faith in Christ, if they trample on your citizens' rights because you refuse to bake a cake or photograph a wedding, if they fine you or arrest you or remand you to re-education, will you keep on trying to reach them? If they put you out of business, will you keep on loving anyway? Paul says, three times I was beaten with rods. That was a Roman punishment. But Roman citizens were never supposed to be subjected to such a beating. You see, again, there was a great danger that someone could die from a beating like that. Unlike the Jews, the young Roman soldiers had no limits on the number of blows that they could inflict on their victim. Paul's rights as a citizen were denied him again and again by angry mobs and activist courts. Nevertheless, Paul kept going back for more blows. He refused to change course and he refused to quit. Beloved, can I tell you, this kind of persecution is already here in America and it is only going to increase from here on out. So we have to decide now, will we pay the high cost of countercultural Christianity or will we fall for another gospel that's compatible with culture? Would you go back for 156 more lashes? Would you go back for an unlimited number of more blows? Would you risk being assaulted by an angry mob again? Would you go back to court? Would you go back to jail? If the other world religions denounce you, will you love enough to keep trying to reach them anyway? You know, the Bible says that in the days ahead, all the world's religions are going to converge into one. Even the Jewish people will embrace that one world religion for a while. Authentic Christians are going to be singled out from among all people on earth. We'll be called unenlightened. Haters, bigots, divisive, draconian, against progress. It's already begun. Are we going to believe that the problem lies with our Christian faith as they say? Or are we going to believe that the problem resides with the escalating antichrist spirit as Jesus has said? If people you once considered brothers turn on you, if they turn you into the government, if they testify against you, will you love them enough to keep trying to reach them anyway? Paul tops off his list of dangers with dangers from false brothers. They were his greatest threat. Jesus said in the last days, brother will betray brother unto death. He said they'll put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. I've told you this, Jesus said, so that when the time comes, you'll remember that I warned you. Beloved, can I tell you that a dividing day is coming to the American church and has already begun. Brothers and sisters are being lured away by another gospel that's compatible with culture. Judge not, lest ye be judged. Twist not scripture, lest ye be like Satan. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone in. Can I tell you, in the days ahead, these will pose the greatest danger to authentic Christians. And they'll think that they're doing God a favor by helping the world to eradicate us. But no matter what our fellow countrymen or other religions or false brothers throw at us, will you keep on loving Christ anyway? Aren't you glad I brought a nice light word this morning for this beautiful Sunday? Counting the cost of countercultural Christianity, three challenges. Will you practice the humility of Christ? 
Will you keep on loving like Christ? And finally this, Harvest Time Church, will you hold on to faith in Christ no matter what the cost? Worship team, you can come help me. Hold on to faith in Christ no matter what the cost. I could make many more observations out of this list of suffering, but let me make one more for you. Paul's third comparison with the false apostles is in the area of self-sacrifice, and here there is no comparison at all. Self-sacrifice and suffering were part of his paradigm of ministry from the very start. But beloved, listen to this. Catch this with your spirit. You might be blessed if you receive it. There's something very curious about Paul's catalog of suffering. Most of the experience that Paul lists here in 2 Corinthians 11 are not recorded by Luke in the book of Acts. The five whippings by the Jews are not recorded in Acts. Only one of the three Roman beatings are recorded in Acts. Paul wrote this list around the time frame that uh, covers, uh, is covered by Acts 20 before he went to Jerusalem and was arrested and appealed to Caesar. The three shipwrecks that Paul lists here are not recorded in Acts. So the shipwreck that is listed in Acts 27 represents a fourth shipwreck that Paul survived. The 24 hours that Paul spent treading water in the open sea is not recorded in the book of Acts. And listen, here's the significance. What this means is that all of these things happened very early in Paul's ministry before he met Luke at a time when it appeared that he would never amount to anything. After Paul met Jesus on the Damascus Road, he spent three years in the Arabian Desert in the Holy Spirit Bible School. When he returned to Damascus, he began preaching Jesus boldly and the Jews immediately tried to kill him. Under the cover of night, Paul fled the city, being lowered over the city wall in a basket. Do you know that's the way they took out the trash? They lowered it over the wall. He went out in a trash basket. And it was a defining moment for Paul. He had come to Damascus riding on a high horse. He had come in an entourage. He had come with a sword. He had come with letters authorizing him to hunt down Christians. He was a quickly rising star in the Jewish hierarchy. But now the hunter had become the hunted. The persecutor had become the persecuted. It was a humiliating descent in the darkness of night. And I think that Paul made a defining decision in that basket. I think that he decided that he was never ever going to shrink back. I think he decided that he was never going to be deterred. I think he decided that no matter what the cost, he wasn't going to stop proclaiming that Jesus is Lord. Paul went to Jerusalem boldly preaching Jesus and the Jews tried to kill him there. So the apostles rushed him off to the seacoast and put him on a ship for his hometown, Tarsus. And for the next 10 years, Paul sewed tents in Tarsus and he preached Jesus with no significant results whatsoever. When Barnabas set out searching for Paul, Luke says he had to go on a manhunt. No one knew who Paul was and no one knew where he was. He writes to the Galatians, during that time, I was unknown. All they heard in Jerusalem was that the man who once persecuted was now preaching Christ and they thanked God for it. And beloved, listen to me. It was during those 10 years of fruitless ministry in Tarsus that Paul endured many of the sufferings that he writes on this list. Five times I was whipped by the Jews. Two out of three times I was beaten with rods by the Romans. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a day and night in the sea. Now, I don't know about you, but after all that, I think I would have concluded that, you know, I'm really just not cut out for this. I think I would have concluded I'm not the man for the job. I haven't really got what it takes. Something is clearly wrong. I'm not doing this right. What's really amazing about this list of suffering is that it kept on growing and growing because Paul kept on going and going and he refused to quit. 
So here's my challenge to you, Harvest Time Church. Will you hold on to faith in Christ no matter what the cost? Will you hold on to faith in His call? Can I tell you, you didn't pick Jesus. Jesus picked you. He called you to salvation. Through 13 years of suffering and no results, Paul never forgot that Jesus called him. He wrote to the Corinthians, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have received this call, we refuse refuse to lose heart though we are squeezed hard we are not squashed though we are confused we are not confounded though we are harassed we will never be abandoned though we are knocked around we are not knocked out no matter what hold on to your call like Paul hold on to faith in his call and second hold on to faith in the power of the gospel beloved listen 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 please hear this Take this home with you. Meditate on it. People's negative reactions to the gospel did not lead Paul to conclude that something was wrong with his message. Their violent reactions didn't lead Paul to conclude that something was wrong with his methods. And neither should we. Paul understood that the gospel is a sharply polarizing spiritual force in the world. To those who are perishing, it is a foolish message that arouses the utmost contempt and it will never be relevant. But to those who believe, it is the power of God that transforms us for eternal salvation. Hold on to faith in His call. Hold on to faith in the power of the gospel. And finally, hold on to faith in the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Beloved, everybody look at me. Inwardly, Paul was unmoved by the popularity of the false apostles. He was not tempted to tweak his message nor change his methods. Paul believed what the false apostles did not. That spiritual transformation does not rely on human talent, nor cleverness, nor attractiveness, but on the work of the Holy Spirit alone. Paul believed it because he experienced it. He believed it because he lived it. And what became of this suffering apostle? Well, when Barnabas finally showed up and took Paul by the hand and led him to Antioch, such a revival began that it redefined the Jesus movement forever. And they said, what shall we call this? This is not the Jesus movement of Jerusalem. This is something we've never seen before. What shall we call them? Let's call them Christians. Paul moved into a ministry that was so full of miracles that he had to stop people from worshiping him as a god. He evangelized the entire western world from Jerusalem to Spain. He wrote one third of the New Testament and after Jesus Christ he became the second most influential man in human history. They say he wasn't much of a looker, Paul. We have a description of him from a man in the church in Philippi. He said Paul had a unibrow. He had a big nose. He was short and his body was badly twisted from all the beatings he endured. But he wrote when Paul preached, his face shone like an angel. Beloved, that's the kind of anointing that I want not the kind that comes from plastic surgery and veneers and makeup, but the kind that changes an ordinary man into something that reflects the glory of God to the world. Counting the cost of countercultural Christianity, Harvest Time Church, will you keep practicing the humility of Christ? Will you keep loving like Christ? Will you hold on to faith in Christ no matter what the cost? Would you stand on your feet and would you give Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big prayer?